Okay, everybody. Let's see uh, how much I can talk to you about... Um, how weird of a shadow it's going to be. Hopefully not too weird. If I won't shake this thing too much drama neither. Um, okay. Hello. Hopefully you guys can see that. Um, I'm just going to talk to you all about flowers as much as possible. So <sighs> anything beyond conifers uh, or trees, pretty much the easiest thing to use for angiosperm identification is, of course, their flowers. As we've seen with the plant families, the flower structure and their characteristics are extremely indicative and very useful for trying to identify a particular uh, a particular plant and what makes these flowers unique. What makes each flower unique is also indicative of how they're related to each other and so forth. So we're going to talk a lot about flowers, see how much I can do. I've got some notes here. Um, we'll see how much I can talk about just off the, uh, off the top of my head. So let's talk about flowers. Also, FYI, I'm a terrible drawer, but that doesn't mean you can't learn, okay? So when we look at the female part of a flower here, which is often referred to as the pistil, but most botanists refer to all the collective female parts as the genetium. As we'll see here in a little bit, there can be most, multiple um, carpels within a single pistil. So if we look at this, this pistil right here, pistil, um, we have a, uh, out here at the tip, which is the stigma, the tip of this pistil where the pollen lands and then little pollen tubes grow up so that the pollen can get in there and fertilize the ovules, which will mature into the eggs and so forth. Down here we have the ovary. Um, this long tube-like structure is called the style. And down here is the, uh, ovary right here at the bottom, right? So... This is a single carpal or pistil. Um, there's a lot of different ways that this thing can be arranged, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But first, let's talk about the uh, the male parts. Here we have these stamens, stamen. So we have the male parts here, right? And the stamens are usually comprised of this anther and this filament. And there can be lots of stamens, of course, in a single flower. And in fact, lots of stamens are indicative of certain families and so forth. But I'm going to try and keep the detailed information to a minimum because this is going to seem extremely verbose already. Okay, so here we've got a flower. I'm going to stop labeling because you have a lot of labels in... Uh, in your botany coloring book and so forth but i just want to kind of give you a way of the, the most basic flower structure here right of course even behind these we've got petals in and amongst all this right and these petals can be fused or separate and we'll talk more about that here in a little bit now the structures that surround the petals and the flower bud before it opens these are called sepals Sometimes these look exactly like petals, and together they're called tepals, like in the Liliaceae family. We see these things that have these six tepals because they all look similar. Um, sometimes all the sepals together are oftentimes referred to as the calyx. Uh, what else do we have? Um, oh, this little swollen portion at the base of the uh, flower is called the receptacle receptacle and that's important because um that receptacle actually can go on to become specific fruit types like peppos it can form the outside of like a cucumber for example or um that's also important growing up into uh droplets or aggregate fruits like raspberries and strawberries and so forth so that's going to be important it can grow up into into an important structure that's important for the formation of fruit here we have this that you know, we call a pedicel. It can also be called a stem. <laughs> There's a million different words for a million different things, okay? Um, what else? Together, all the petals form the corolla. Um, 
the whole flower, which includes the corolla and the calyx, is referred to as the um, perianth. So all words that you're here, I know you can't read that, perianth is what that's called. But just to give you kind of a layout of the basic structures of the simplest and kind of quintessential classic flower example. Now the thing is, is that this isn't going to be, this is, this is what we call monocarpus, meaning it has a single carpal uh, that comprises that female, the female parts of the flower or the genetium, right? Which is that stigma style and that ovary right here in the middle. But the genetium and the andresium, by the way, is the male part. It looks, it's spelled like, uh, it looks like gynoecium or something, but it's genetium. So it's spelled gynoecium um, for genetium, and then andresium is basically androecium, but andresium. These are all the male, this is the male part, so the andresium are the, the stamens, essentially, okay, which are filled with those pollen grains inside of the anthers connected to those filaments, all right? Now, this is your simplest example of this, okay? Um, you can have a lot of different combinations. You can have... Uh, you can have lots of carpels as part of the pistil <laughs> or as part of the genetium, which is a little more um, botany-centric, if you will. You'll hear uh, horticulturists and so forth say pistil uh, and botanists tend to focus on genetium because it includes a lot of different variants on on those carpels. So here's a here's a saying that's like the stigma stood over the carp barrel like carpal and shot them with a pistol, pistol so she could eat them. So one pistol can have lots of carpals basically. All right. So you can have, um, and this, these things can be apocarpus where you can have, maybe you have this structure and then this like that. And let's pretend like that flower isn't originating right there. Um, in which case we have an apocarpus arrangement of carpels, meaning that they're, um, or sorry, syncarpus, jeez, syncarpus, meaning that they're fused here. Same goes for like sympetalus. You'll see this apocarpus and sympetalus if you have a, all these petals are separate to the flower. Man, I'm really good at drawing petals. All these are separate. If they're arranged in like this tubular structure for like looking down at a, a down a flower or whatever, like a borage, like Sorinthi major in the Baraganaceae family. If we're looking at a, a fused group of petals, then that's that's um, synpetalous, syn just like we see with the syncarpus and the fused in the fused carpels here. But we can have multiple carpels that are apocarpus, and in which case we would basically say, look, there's three carpels and three pistils, but you can have one pistil and three carpels. And then you can have, um, just to give you an example of how you would talk about the different arrangements of the female parts in the flower. Okay, so that's pistil versus carpal. This is the genetium or the female parts of the flower. Uh, and there could be multiple ones that like you can have, you can have multiple apocarpus carpals in the center of a flower, if that makes any sense. So you can have, you can have a flower, you can have a flower carpal, then you can have another carpal, then you can have another carpal. This is so bad, I'm sorry. Um, but just to give you an idea, and in fact, it's all of these carpals that go on to form something like strawberries and aggregate fruit, for example. We're going to always keep track of how the flowers turn into the fruit. I'm not going to throw fruit at you quite yet, but I just want to kind of give you a layout of all of these things. Um, there's also every possible flower. So if you have a bisexual flower that has both the male and female parts, we call that monoclinus. Uh, and then you can have diclinus, which is a unisexual flower, uh, where you have, um, where you have, hopefully you guys can see this, where you have a flower, and let's just with the carpal, and then um, it has no stamens, right? 
You can also have this. So this is called um, Pistolet, meaning it only has pistols. It's also called Imperfect. This is the perfect flower. It's bisexual, has both parts. It's important because um, it can self-fertilize, even though that's obviously not ideal. And a lot of flowers have a lot of extremely adaptive evolutionary mechanisms that prevent self-fertilization because you guys know hopefully that it's not good evolutionarily and, and for ad adaptive benefit. But you can have imperfect flowers that are unisexual or monoclonous and they can have every possible combination. You can literally just have a carpel for a flower attached to this receptacle, to this pedestal. You can have them with just a calyx. And you can have them, of course, with petals, right? And you'll see that when you do your uh, botany coloring book. Don't mess this up. You'll see this little plus sign in there and it'll be pointing to something. It just means leave it blank. And it's just to show you that some flowers only have certain certain things. You can also have staminate. Hopefully you guys can see what I'm doing. You can also have just staminate flowers. Well, let's see, we have a receptacle. And then you've just got just stamens for an individual flower. So this is just a male flower, right? This is just a female flower. We can use the signs for male and female. This is just a male flower. And then now you can have, hopefully you guys can see that. Now you can have just a male flower um, with or without a calyx and with or without petals. There's pretty much every combination in nature is basically what we're talking about. Now, for our, by, before our unisexual imperfect flowers, when you look at an individual tree or a uh, shrub or um, herbaceous plant, for example, each of these little flowers along here, and we'll talk about inflorescence or flower arrangements here in a little bit, each of these can have all kinds of different arrangements of um, where the males and females are, right? So in a monoclonous, perfect flower, all the flowers have both the male and female parts on the plant. Now, in diclonous flowers that are unisexual, you can have one that has uh, both the male and female flowers on the same plant. Here we go. On the same plant, those are just female female and male signs on that thing. Or you can have separate male and female plants that only have male or female flowers on them. Maybe all these flowers, for example, are uh, male, right? And then maybe all these flowers are female. So if you got male and female here on the, um, on the same plant, but each separate sex on each flower, then we've got Monetius. It looks like C-I-O-U-S. It looks like uh, Monoecious or something, but it's Monetius and Dioecious, um, which again looks like Dioecious, but it's Dioecious. Um, these are just different distinctions of whether or not you have all male or all female flowers on one plant or male and female separate flowers on a single plant for that diclonous distinction for how you can have the genetium and dendritium or the male and female parts arranged within a single flower. Now, if that's not complicated enough, where the genetium sits inside of the flower is also an important distinction because certain types of plants have those female parts and certain arrangements within the flower. So you can have a hypogynous flower and it looks like hypogynous. You can have a hypogynous flower, which just has, once again, a terrible carpal drawings. You can have a hypogynous flower where the ovary uh, 
the sepals, the petals, and stamens are um, attached below the ovary. So, and we call this a superior ovary, okay? Um, <laughs> let, me, let me show you guys this. So, I'm going to draw just the, here we go, stamens sitting at their insertion point below that ovary, right? Usually here to the calyx, and then we've got stem, whatever. And then you can have this ovary of the carpal sitting within what's called a hypanthium, which is this floral cup where the sepals, petals, and stamens are all fused right here. Sepals. Okay, so I didn't even draw the petals on this one. So here, let's add some petals here. These petals are fused right here below. Then you can, I don't know if I left myself enough room. Let's make some more space, y'all. So if any of you guys can draw, don't talk smack to me. Then you can also have a pyriginous flower, which once again looks like paragynous, but it's pyriginous. You can have this ovary sitting in this cup-like structure that's fumed, fumed, that's formed by the fusion of these stamens and these petals and this calyx into one structure that lets this thing just float out in here. We call the structure the hypanthium. This cup-like structure is important because we see it in a few different um, plant families like the rosaceae. Uh, really, really important. Um, oh, that's all I'll throw at you about families right there. Then you can have an epigenous, and this is an inferior ovary where the ovary sits. Can you guys see that? Where the, here we got stigma style ovary. And this thing is actually sitting within or below the calyx where we have the fusion of these stamens and these petals. But the ovary is sitting below where all of these join together at their origin. We call this epigenous. Epigynous is what this looks like. A pigeonous, okay? Now, a pigeonous flowers have this inferior ovary. They've got the sepals, those petals and stamen attached near the top of the ovary, okay? That's where they're original. Now they do fuse and wrap around all this tissue, but that original insertion point is at the top of that ovary. In pigeonous flowers, there's that hypanthium or cup-like structure, okay? Um, technically, pyrigenous flowers have like a half inferior ovary. It's kind of sitting there in that cup and it's not technically below that insertion point. Um, and like I said, rosaceae family, so plums, roses, peaches, uh, you see have hypanthiums. And the hypanthium is important because it goes on to form certain, uh, the, the, you structure in certain fruits. Oh, you can't even see that. <laughs> Sorry, guys. So, this perigin is kind of half inferior ovary. This inferior ovary in the pigeon's flower. Uh, this is a guava or a cucumber, even a sunflower, actually, which sit in a um, deep down. The dysphorets sit deep down in that flower. And then we have this hypogenous option where we have those sepals and petals and stamens attached below the ovary. We have this superior ovary sitting on top of that insertion. This is like, uh, this can be things like lilies, for example. Lilies have this. And this is important because sometimes, um, Sometimes this is important structure. If you're like, oh, I can't really figure out what kind of flower this is. If there's a ton of them, and obviously you're not in an area that uh, that that is important for conservation. Um, like, you know, if you're pulling apart a weedy flower, for example, something on the roadside, then you can dissect your flowers and kind of figure out the ovary position, and, and that can help you narrow down exactly what you're looking at. Okay, so superior ovary things like mustard, 
family and lilies, liliaceae, just to give you an outline of how the, the Genetian position, okay, in, um, in flowers. Now, to the more, <laughs> you guys doing okay? I hope everybody's doing okay. We've had 20 minutes of flower anatomy, and I know it's a lot, and I'm just kind of uh, spitballing right here, but I want to go just kind of talk to you about all the things that you could think about when it comes to flowers. Now, something that's really important is uh, <laughs> inflorescence type. So you can have determinate and indeterminate fluorescences. Uh, determinant inflorescences, basically the first flower to open is at the top of that flower, okay? Now, determinant fluorescences can be simple, something like, I don't know, like a tulip, right? They can be compound, where you've got a bunch of different flowers at the end. Um, and compound determinant inflorescences we call cymes. And then you can have simple and compound indeterminate fluorescences. So determinate, basically, all right, leaf, leaf, leaf. Here, flowers first, right? Here we got a tulip. This is important because it's also just a simple flower at the top. And then this can also be compound, meaning that you can have, here. <laughs> there are no tulips that are compound, but I'm gonna go with a flower that looks like this. Uh, flower, flower, flower. If the first one, the flower, is here at the top, or the top, then we still have determinate inflorescence, meaning the first flowers to open is at the top. It can also technically be at the middle um, if you have a compound inflorescence that, that goes like this. Let's say you've got some growth that looks like this, and then you've got, boom, this flower in the middle, but it's determinate because it's at the end of that apical bud, okay? So, determinant inflorescence, first flower to open is at the top or the middle. Now, there can, you can have a simple flower that has determinant fluorescence, like a tulip, but um, you can also have compound determinant inflorescences, where the first flower is, opens at the top or the middle, and a lot of these have different, there's a lot of different shapes of these things, and their shape uh, is something something cyme. So these are called cymes, which are compound determinant inflorescences. One that we'll run into more often than not were like kind of Virginia bluebells or whatever, Mertensia, uh, have these things that we call scorpioid cymes, where you've got kind of this, this flower, number one, and then you've got this, uh, this kind of growth here that kind of looks like a scorpion tail, um, if that makes any sense, kind of flowering in this direction, but here, one, whatever, two, three, four, five. As long as you have that, uh, and it depends on which one of these grow for grow first, but this, this is called a scorpioid sign. So scorpioid cymes. So compact, compound determinant fluorescences, cymes, okay? Now when we look at indeterminate inflorescences where the first flowers to open are at the base of the stem, then we have a lot of different combinations there too, okay? I'm not gonna, I won't run you guys through all of the different cymes. There's compound cymes, there's scorpioid cymes, there's, if this grows enough like a circle, then this can be called a helicoid cyme. And each time we've got these first flowers kind of opening at the end of each of this growth bud um, right here before it goes off flowering. And when you go through your, your botany coloring book, I believe it's numbered, I can't remember, it's been years since I did that thing. Um, I will upload pictures of my, my old one though, because I usually drew the flowers beside the fruit and that's really, really useful. Um, so when we look at indeterminate inflorescences, these are usually called racemes or racemes. So when we have a raceme, so, okay, so indeterminate inflorescence is where you've got, uh, okay, so let's, let's see if you can see this. We've got this and then we've got boom, flower, and then uh, boom, flower, and then boom, flower, and then boom, flower, flower. So this is a racine type growth, okay? And usually you'll hear the term, um, you'll hear these terms intermixed. You'll hear like 
uh, racemus corum, or you'll hear um, corum like racine. And I've seen both both used, and, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a second, okay? So with a racine, you've got these, these first flowers opening up here. One, and then two, and then three, and four, and five, and so on and so forth, where the first flowers to open are at the base. Um, I think in reality, y'all, as I've paid attention to different flower types blooming over the time, I think, like, this one will open first, sure, but sometimes, sometimes this will be due, and that'll be three, and that'll be four, but they're... It's not necessarily one, two, three, four, five, six, like always in perfect sequence. It's just the first flowers to open are towards the bottom, okay? So if this is a raceme, you can have lots of different, uh, like there's all kinds of different evolutionary modifications or versions of these racemes, right? So you can have a raceme where you lose these second, these pedicels right here, right? And this, where we have flowers here, this is called a spike. So this is just one, and then two, and three, and so forth, right? And you can say racema spike, but usually you'll just hear spike uh, for that particular flower type. Now you can also have the inner nodes lost in between each of these flowers as a different variation on a raceme. And uh, hopefully you guys can see that. You can have these inner nodes lost. And if you lose these inner nodes, then you can have basically what's called a simple umble. And these simple umbles is where you have, okay, well this one on the outside, one. And then it could be two, and then three, and then four. Also, this could also be one at the same time, if that makes any sense. And then this could be two, two, and then three. But you have these flowers on the, the outside flowering first because it's an indeterminate inflorescence in this umbel. So umbel. Uh, this is a simple umbel. There are complex umbels and, and, and complex or compound umbels are indicative of the Apiaceae family or the carrot uh, parsley family, like APB8. Uh, what else we got? Oh, you can also have kind of a compounding of a raceme. <laughs> so, so you can have like, okay, well, here's a long stem, and then you can have a, a raceme off of it. Flower, 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 flower. And then look. And then we have one off of here, and then flower, 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 flower. So in this case, this is called a panicle. Um, you'll see these in... Uh, some grasses, for example. I'm trying to think if all of the grasses are panicles. Some grasses are spikes or spikelets, as they're oftentimes referred to. Um, now, if you have a, a if the stem just kind of, if this whole stem, if we just kind of crunched it down into one big thing, uh, or kind of like maybe crunch this umble down into one big thing, this is a capitulum, which is kind of what you see in a uh, in the Asteraceae or the sunflower family. This is the head or whatever, and then here we have one, you know, two, two, one, three, three, for example. So we've got these ray florets and these disc florets opening in that order. It's still a complex um, indeterminate inflorescence but you gotta look really closely at a sunflower head to kind of make that out. There's even more combinations, y'all. Uh, don't worry, I'll compost this paper and feed it to my, feed it to my flowers. Uh, what else you got? Okay, here's a cool one. Uh, one kind of looks like a candelabra or a menorah. Is that what they're called? Um, this thing where you've got these flowers kind of coming up to form this perfect top. And I believe I've got some footage from my garden with Stars of Bethlehem that kind of uh, are like this. And then we've got one and one, whatever, two, two, three, four. Um, this is called a quorum, C-O-R-Y-M-B, quorum. That's a cool one. Um, I don't think what it, and this, this thing can compound too. You can also have, uh, you can have a quorum Come off a quorum. 
And that's a compound quorum. Um, oh, compound umble we still didn't look at. Now, compound umble is important. Actually, let's save that last because compound umble is useful to talk about Brax, which is which is a really, really important thing to talk about. So there's another one that you'll see that's spelled D T C T H Y R S E. This is called a fierce. It kind of looks like fiercey, which reminds me of thirsty, which always makes me giggle a little. Um, so this is a fierce. A fierce <laughs> looks like a looks like a compound umble, uh, a top of a compound umble, or more like a simple umble on top of a simple umble on top of a simple umble. But in a fierce, we've got, let's see if I can draw this. Got this V shape, and then here we've got number one, and then at the end we've got twos, but then we've got, uh, then we've got, threes coming off of here threes and then you have that all around you've got the exact same thing on the other side and then and we'll talk about what specific types of flowers you'll see these blooms in here in a little bit and then this has this going on <laughs> i know that's a mess um and then this is even maybe this is still growing from that stem um, but this is why you can call this an indeterminate inflorescence because these, these flowers are happening down lower first, like the ones, and maybe, maybe these are whatever, one, two, three, maybe this is four and four, if that makes any sense. But this is just another inflorescence arrangement called a Sears. And then, okay, last inflorescence type we'll talk about, um, compound umble. So in a compound umble, this is like a bunch of simple umbels together. So we've got this, and then one, two, three, four, five, or something, and then this, and then one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know if five is a good number or not, but this is a compound umbel, an indicative of that character parsley family, and we've got this. Uh, each one of these would be like one and one, and then like one and one, and then two and two, and then two and two, as far as bloom order goes. God, I hope I've answered that. That's what these numbers are, y'all. <laughs> the number in which the flowers open, first a flower, okay? Hopefully that, that was kind of intuitive. If not, that's what that means, okay? So compound umble, something we see in the APAC family. Now, just to kind of run you through some examples of these things, let's see what we've got. Uh, let's flip this back over. Oh, grab this one. Okay, okay. So like uh, Racine could be. Um, can you see that? Yeah, I'm pointing at Racine. So Racine will be something like um, I don't know Solomon's Seal, for example, and then we'll see. Uh, we talked about the Capitulum, like an Asteraceae family, daisies, uh, sunflowers, um, Philadelphia fleabane. Simple umbles we'll see in like the, uh, like cherries. I think I've got that in video. I'm trying to do as much redundancy as possible. Spikes you'll see in things like plantains and the Plantagenaceae, um, family. Aunt Jane the plantain, uh... Oh, there's another flower type I didn't mention, y'all. Um, one thing that we'll see, it's called a spadix, and it's this weird, uh, down in here, we'll act like you can actually see it, but actually you can only see this part that's poking out. The spadix is kind of like a little hooded character that we'll see in the Aracy, um family for uh, Jack and the Pulpits. This thing is called a spadix. It's just a modified bract, which is a, is a type of modified leaf. And we'll see that in that family. Uh, I'm trying to think about what else you would see. Oh, another thing, y'all. Sometimes you'll see this specialized flower called a catkin. Catkin is just this flower. Like the male, it's like a, usually it's all male flowers, I think. And it looks like this. 
and it kind of hangs down from like hazelnut trees. Um, and you'll see these things in lots of different tree species that have these separate all male and female flowers. You see that? Can't really see what you can see super well. So that's a captain, just another inflorescence type. Um, what else we got? Um, so when we look at, so, okay, okay. Um, grasses can be panicles, can be racemes, and can be spikes. We can have all those combinations in grasses. And in fact, if you look at a grass flower even closer, it's got these little things, oftentimes, if you look at them super close, it's got these, uh, let's see if I can draw this. These things are called spikelets. Spikelets. And then if you look really closely, if you kind of open up, um, and at the base of these spikelets, you have these things called glooms. Glooms. Uh, and each of these little things are called florets. If you open a floret, <laughs> which are also just modified leaves, these glooms, modified leaves, these outside of these florets, which are called paleas and lemmas. Uh, <laughs> so if we open one of these, you can have what's called a palea and a lemma. And then um, this is where our stuff's gonna be, y'all. These are where we have, you'll, usually you'll see the stigma poking up down in here, and then you'll see anthers and filaments. They're tiny. Usually you need a magnifying glass to see that kind of thing. But a lot of people don't realize that when, when they're looking at grasses, that that's, that's the flower that they're looking at, okay? So getting back to our compound umbels that we have right here, there's this base of things right here that kind of look like it'd be the calyx, but this is called an involucre because rather than fused sepals, what we have here is fused bracts. And these, so B-R-A-C-T, bracts. Bracts are just modified leaves. And when we get fused bracts together, we call these involucres, which kind of looks like um, involucre. It looks like involucre or in, but it's involucre. And the second set of fused bracts, we call an involucel, involucel, or yeah, y'all, these pronunciations are so weird. I think some people will say like involucel or involucra, but it's involucre and involucel, okay? So um, sometimes we'll see really, really cool uh, involucres that are highly like spread out. If we're looking at underneath a, uh, underneath a compound umbel of some members of the, uh, God, that is terrible. Let me try that again. So if we look at the, let's say we could look at the bottom of a compound umbel that we see in the APAC family, this could go like this. I don't think this is gonna be any better. But sometimes you'll see these, it looks kind of like, like just parts of the stem, um, but these are just modified leaves that we call an involucre, okay? The whole back of a sunflower is an is 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 in is called an involucre. Okay? Um so if we look at whatever, side slice through a we've got all of our disflorets. These are all individual flowers in a sunflower. And then we've got our ray floret, which is this usually sterile female flowers that kind of be, that kind of tell the pollinators, hey, y'all come check this out. All this together, part of the corolla. Um, we still have this, this whole empty space right here, what we call the receptacle, which I think I've mentioned already. Hopefully I'm not shaking that camera too much for you guys. Once again, this all meets together. But there are, a lot of times you'll see these little, uh, kind of look like leaves 
on the back of the green head of a sunflower, but these are involucral bracts, okay? They're just those modified leaves to the back of that embolicer. Receptacle holding all that stuff. Pedicel holding the capitulum, which is just the big name for the whole flower. Um, and once again, lots of times we see modified bracts. We'll see this. I think I have video footage of dogwoods, which the, the white things look like flowers. Those are just bracts. Those are modified leaves. The flowers actually open up on the inside. Um, the spadix of a jack in the pulpit is just a modified leaf or a bract. The uh, outside of a... Um, what else? Yeah, the outside of the APAC will have these modified bracts as well. I'm trying to think of other examples. Y'all, oh, poinsettias. Poinsettias, the big red things that look like leaves, those are just, those are modified leaves that are called bracts. The flowers are, are attached to those. Um, they're very, very, it's a type of euphorbia. It's in the euphorbiaceae family. Oh, and that'll get us to our next topic. There are lots of weird versions of flowers that don't have petals or sepals or anything, okay? And I have examples of this from the Euphorbiaceae family, which there's not a whole lot of native versions of these, but they, they're a really good demonstrative demonstration of exceptions to the rule because they have these flowers that uh, oftentimes, let's kind of just act like we can look down one. They kind of have these super weird syncarpus weird shaped um, female flowers, right? And these will be attached to this pedestal. And then in the one that I show you, like the Mediterranean spurge, they'll have these things that they're attached to that we call um, cyathophils. <laughs> these kind of just touch here. This is just a modified leaf called a cyathophil that we only see, and they're, they're photosynthetic oftentimes. Um, all together, these things are called uh, cyathiums. Cyathiums. Really, really weird version of a flower. Sometimes you'll have a cyathium that's only female, and then you'll have some that are only male. Sometimes you'll see... Uh, sometimes you'll see male flowers also. Um attached to this same part, which will be like a, once again, they're really weird shaped and euphorbious. But in my Mediterranean spurge, you'll see that these are separate. And once again, I have a video of that to kind of help you. But just a really neat example, uh, these things also have ne nectaries, which are these weird hidden glands that just secrete sugar. So these basically trick Pollinators, hey, come check out my pretty flower, except it's not necessarily a pretty flower. It takes a lot of energy to make all these pretty fancy flowers. Um, Euphorbia, which are, which have evolved to be super awesome, tough, succulenty type plants, um, are very drought resistant, obviously, and have so so evolved these, these flowers that are still pretty, um, but also super tough and very drought resistant and so forth. They bloom for forever months, which is why I love them. Um, so cyathiums. Now that's so. This is a flower with no sepals or no petals. Kind of an exception to the rule. Looks like a flower, but it's not. There's also another really weird example of a flower that looks like a flower that is not a flower, uh, or is a flower, but <laughs> it doesn't look like it would be one. And these are in figs, y'all. I don't think a lot of people know, but figs, which are fertilized by wasps that crawl inside and fertilize them and die, and um, we won't get into, <laughs> into the life cycle. Now I'll uh, send you guys video of it because it's super, super cool. But you basically have male and female fig trees. The male figs, um, or the male and female figs, which are called capra figs, they have the male and female flowers. They have the perfect, uh, they have the male and female flowers inside of this weird structure. It's basically like an inside out flower that we call a synconium, okay? So in, in the synconium, let's kind of draw this. 
Here's our, might be a fig eventually, okay? This is a synconium. It's got this, <laughs> kind of like this, uh, let's say there's a little bit of tissue up right here. This would be our sepal. Um, and then we've got, <laughs> we've got in a, in a, in a, in a female synconium, or a capra fig in a, in a female, uh, hold on. Let me, let me make sure to not misspeak on this. Cause this is some, this is complicated. Okay. When in edible figs, let's just start there. In edible figs, basically we have all female flowers. They're pistillate. Okay. Meaning that on the inside we have, uh, only female flowers in here. They're on the inside, okay? Let's just draw these female flowers. These are female flowers on the inside of this weird synconium type structure, okay? Now wasp larva gets in here and does some pollinating and all this kind of other gross stuff. Um, and once again, we've got male and female flowers on the inside of this thing. So, um, or in the female one, we only have the female flowers, which have these, uh, short styles okay or these styles sticking off the inside of these flowers that are kind of turned inside out okay um so we only have females in the what's called a capra fig got the same thing capra fig uh these are both synconiums, okay? We've got edible fig, only female flowers, right? Requiring that cross-pollination. But then we've got male and female flowers in the uh, capra fig. And the capra fig you do not want to eat, okay? You've got these male and female flowers on the inside. You have this opening. Caprifig synconium. So another super weird version of a flower. This kind, this 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 time it's basically inside out. This is attached to some branch up here. We've got edible fig synconiums and caprifig synconiums. These are these have male and female flowers on the inside. Male and female flowers on the inside. They are the male flowers are staminate, and then the short styles are in the female flowers. Very short styles in these female flowers. Edible figs require this cross-pollination from these long styles. Uh, from wasps, like I mentioned before. Um, I'm trying to remember what else I can tell you guys about this. So, capra figs, male and female flowers on the inside, edible figs, only female flowers require that cross-pollination to form uh, that edible fruit that will go on to become... You can try and eat capra figs, y'all, but they taste nasty, kind of like hard, dried, um, and they have a darker blue color to them as well, um, which is a difference in, in, the, in the fruit. But that cross-pollination with those long-styled... Uh, female flowers and the edible figs forms this more edible fruit. So this is a synconium, two different versions we see in figs, just another weird version of a flower that's not like, uh, it's not like other flowers that have these petals and um, these sepals exposed. And you'll see in your, in, in your book, there's a, there's a, there's a few other variations, but I think these are the keys, okay? So we've looked at um, the male and female parts of the flower, how they can have only male parts and only female parts, how those flower parts can be arranged within the flower itself, how those flowers can be arranged 
along a stem or pedicel in terms of indeterminate and determinate fluorescences, inflorescences or growth. And we looked at some weird exceptions to these rules like the cyathiums and the synconiums um, where you have flowers that don't have petals at all, at all. Um, like we see in the cyathium and the synconiums where we have these flowers on the inside, like in the fig family. So lots of weird different versions of flowers and flower structures and um, lots of things to think about when you look at your next flower. How is it arranged? How, where is that ovary sit? Uh, does it have male and female parts? Is it only a male or female flower? Is it a typical flower? Is it missing something? Is it missing petals? Is it missing sepals? Uh, <laughs> is it some weird exception to the rule? So lots of things, hopefully this wasn't too much. Um, and was a fine way to go about doing this. You'll get lots of practice when you try to color these things in, but I just wanted to kind of give you guys a breakdown of all the things that I can think about. I think that's it. In terms of uh, thinking about flowers. Thanks so much, you guys.